Today's case takes place in Bunkyo Ward, located in the heart of Tokyo, Japan. The central figure in this story is Nami Kikuchi, born in 2000 in Hitachi City, Ibaraki Prefecture. From a young age, Nami was an adorable and charming girl, always with a bright smile on her face. By 2018, at the age of 18, Nami had grown into a beautiful young woman. She was accepted into the Japan Pharmaceutical University in Bunkyo Ward, Tokyo, and became a first-year pharmacy student. With her cheerful and outgoing personality, Nami quickly adapted to the vibrant university environment. She easily made friends and built good relationships with her peers and upperclassmen. Nami had a particular passion for gaming and would spend several days each month visiting entertainment centers, sometimes inviting a few friends to join her. Like many others, she enjoyed playing mobile games, especially Knives Out, a battle royale game developed by NetEase. Released in Japan in 2017, it consistently ranked as the top mobile battle royale game in the country. Through Knives Out, Nami befriended a man. They eventually followed each other on Twitter and continued to keep in touch, both in and out of the game. The two communicated very well, sharing almost everything with each other. However, their interactions were purely online, and they had never met in person. That changed in November 2018, when the two decided to meet in person. Nami, excited for their first encounter, couldn't have known that it would also be the last day of her life. So, what exactly happened to Nami that day? Join us on Crime Documentary Files as we uncover today's case. One day in November 2018, the Bunkyo Ward Police Department in Tokyo received a call reporting a missing person. The caller, a 52-year-old man, told the police that his daughter had gone to meet a man on November 20th and then disappeared. The family had tried everything but couldn't reach her, so they hoped the police would quickly investigate and find her whereabouts. The missing girl, Nami Kikuchi, was 18 years old, the eldest child in her family, with a younger brother. The family was middle class, her father was self-employed, and her mother worked at a hospital. Nami's parents had divorced when she was young, and her mother had moved Nami and her brother from Hitachi City, Ibaraki Prefecture, to Tokyo, where she raised them alone. During high school, Nami began discussing her future career plans with her friends. Likely influenced by her mother, she developed a passion for medicine and helping people, turning it into her dream. Nami aimed to attend medical school after graduation to work in healthcare. She devoted much of her time and effort to studying, and her hard work paid off when she was accepted into Japan Pharmaceutical University in Bunkyo Ward, Tokyo, fulfilling her aspirations. After starting college at age 18, Nami moved out and lived on her own in Katsushika Ward, Tokyo. Nami's father told the police that, despite the divorce, he had never lacked love for his two children. Mr. Kikuchi regularly kept in touch with them, and they maintained a strong relationship. Being his firstborn, Nami was especially dear to him. After she got her cell phone, Mr. Kikuchi would text or call her nearly every three days, even after Nami moved to Tokyo for university and started living on her own in Katsushika Ward, they still stayed in touch as usual. When Nami moved into her new apartment, she took pictures of the setup and sent them to her father. In her free time, Nami enjoyed experimenting with baking cookies in her apartment. After each batch, she would snap photos and share them with her father. When his schedule allowed, Mr. Kikuchi would occasionally travel from Ibaraki to Tokyo to visit his daughter. He would stay for a few days and explore the city with her. Mr. Kikuchi also told the police that on the morning of November 19th, he had received a message from Nami saying, Sorry, Dad. I stayed over at a friend's last night. I'll call you next time. The day before, on November 18th, Mr. Kikuchi had called Nami several times, but she hadn't answered, so she texted him the next day to explain. After receiving that message, Mr. Kikuchi didn't reply immediately, thinking his daughter might be busy and planned to reach out later. Two days later, he sent her a few more messages expressing how much he missed her, asking if she was done with her work, and if he could call her. After waiting a long time with no response, he tried calling again, only to find that her phone was turned off. At this point, Mr. Kikuchi grew increasingly worried. He called Nami's mother to ask if their daughter had come home, but her mother said she had not. Realizing their daughter had lost contact, both parents rushed to her apartment in Katsushika Ward, 
where she lived alone, to check on her. When they arrived, the apartment was locked, and it seemed that no one was inside. They asked the apartment manager about Nami's whereabouts, and the manager told them that she had left for school on the morning of November 20th, but hadn't returned since then. The manager didn't know where she might be. Fearing their daughter might have run away, Nami's parents borrowed a key from the manager to enter the apartment and check. Inside, everything seemed to be in order, and her personal belongings were mostly there. Her phone charger was still on the desk. According to Nami's habits, if she planned to be away for a long time, she would definitely take her charger with her. But since several days had passed, it was clear she didn't intend to leave for just a short time. Nami's parents decided to visit her university. There, they met with the head of the pharmacy department and asked if their daughter had attended classes recently. The head confirmed that Nami had left the school after her class ended at 3 p.m. on November 20th and had not returned since. One of her classmates mentioned that after class on the afternoon of November 20th, Nami had planned to meet a man. However, no one knew who this man was or where Nami had gone. At this point, Nami's parents grew even more concerned. They feared that something bad had happened to her during this meeting. Mr. Kikuchi contacted the police again, requesting their assistance in investigating the case. Upon receiving the report, Bunkyo Ward Police immediately launched an investigation. They searched the area around Japan Pharmaceutical University, checked the routes leading to nearby train stations, and interviewed local residents and passers-by. Nami's parents also printed missing person flyers with her photo and information. They distributed the flyers in places they believed she might have visited, hoping to gather leads. Through their investigation, the police discovered that Nami had a boyfriend. He reported that at around 9 p.m. on November 20th, Nami had texted him saying, How are you? What are you up to right now? I want to see you. Are you busy? I want to go to karaoke and watch a movie with you. Goodbye and good night. As for Nami leaving school to meet another man that afternoon, he claimed he had no knowledge of this and had never heard her mention it. According to their investigation, Nami's phone last pinged a cell tower at 11 p.m. on November 20th. After that, her phone signal disappeared and never returned. The last location of the signal was not in Tokyo, but in Kamisu City, south of Ibaraki Prefecture, about 52 miles from Nami's university. This was likely Nami's destination that day. By piecing together the clues, the police successfully retraced Nami's movements that day. At 3 p.m., she finished her class at Japan Pharmaceutical University. She then left the school and headed north for five miles to Taito Ward. There, she boarded the Tokyo Metro Chiyoda Line at Ueno Station. At Kita Senju Station in Adachi Ward, Nami changed trains for the first time and took the JR Joban line. After reaching Tokyo Station, she switched again to the JR Sobu line and continued eastward toward Ibaraki Prefecture. At 5.36 p.m. that day, Nami arrived at Kashima Jingu Station in southern Ibaraki Prefecture. She exited the station from the south exit and headed to the nearby taxi stand. Seven minutes later, at 5.43 p.m., Nami got into a taxi driven by driver A. The police later tracked down this taxi driver. He told the police that Nami had gotten into his car that evening, but didn't specify her exact destination, only instructing him to drive south toward Kamasu City. As they traveled along Route 124 in Kamasu, just before passing a furniture store, Nami told the driver to make a left turn at the intersection. The car then headed east along a road and stopped at the first convenience store on that road. At around 6 p.m., the taxi driven by A pulled into the parking lot of a Family Mart convenience store. Nami got out after paying about $25 for the ride. The location was 4.8 miles south of Kashima Jingu Station and 51 miles northeast of Nami's university. According to driver A, Nami had been looking down at her phone for most of the ride, occasionally tapping on the screen as if she was messaging someone. What puzzled driver A was that after she got out of the taxi, Nami didn't stop at the store. Instead, she continued walking east along the road, and then she disappeared from sight. The police reviewed the security footage from outside the Family Mart store and indeed saw images of Nami. 
The situation matched Driver A's account almost exactly. The last known location of Nami was likely somewhere near the store. Next, the police began investigating individuals with criminal records in the vicinity of Kamisu City. A 35-year-old man named Koichi Hirose quickly became a suspect. Hirose worked at a construction materials company in Kashima City, southeast of Ibaraki Prefecture, and lived in the Tuchome area of Kamisu City, not far from the family mart where Nami had been. Upon investigation, it was discovered that Koichi Hirose had been arrested twice before. One of the incidents occurred the previous year, when Hirose had met a 12th grade girl from Chiba Prefecture through Twitter. Despite knowing she was a minor, he had lured her into a sexual relationship by offering her money. Fortunately, the girl's family discovered the situation in time and contacted the police, preventing further harm. Hirose was subsequently arrested and fined about $4,500. Hirose admitted to the police that he knew Nami and had met her on November 20th. That day, they met outside a 7-Eleven convenience store. This store was located 656 feet east of the family mart, where she had been last seen. Hiros then drove Nami to his home, which was only a two-minute drive away. Hiros explained to the police that both he and Nami were fans of the game Knives Out, and they had met through this mobile game. After a while, they started following each other on Twitter. Over time, Nami confided in him that she was struggling with tuition and living expenses, and wanted to find a part-time job. Hirose suggested they meet in exchange for money, with the understanding that they would start dating. Nami had secretly gone to meet him without informing her boyfriend. That day, Nami spent two hours at Hirose's home. At 8 p.m., as requested by Nami, Hirose drove her to a nearby main road, but said he didn't know where she went afterward. After gathering this lead, investigators thoroughly checked the route from the 7-Eleven to Hirose's apartment. He lived in a two-story apartment building north of a park. Each floor had three households, and the stairs to the second floor were on the left side of the building. Hirose's apartment was number 203 on the second floor. A nearby resident reported that around 8 p.m. on November 20th, he had seen a young girl walking along the road, crying and appearing to be distressed. Her appearance and description closely matched that of Nami. Another resident told the police that on that same evening, Nami had knocked on his door and asked for directions to Hirose's apartment. The neighbor noticed Nami seemed upset and angry about something, so he hesitated to give her the address right away. Instead, he asked why she was looking for Hirose. Nami explained that she and Hirose had some financial issues to settle. She only knew that he lived nearby, but wasn't sure of the exact location. After learning this, the resident, feeling sorry for the girl who seemed harmless, eventually gave Nami Hirose's address. A resident living in apartment 101 on the first floor of Hirose's building told the police that around 9 p.m. that night, he saw Nami angrily walking up to the second floor and pounding on Hirose's door. She was crying as she knocked. After a while, Hirose finally opened the door. Shortly after, the two came back down, and Hiros drove Nami away in his Silver K car. By this point, the police knew that Hiros was the last person to have seen Nami before her disappearance, making him the primary suspect. However, they still lacked concrete evidence to charge him. Two months after the incident, the police interrogated Koichi Hiros once again. This time, his story changed slightly compared to his previous account but he still did not admit to being involved in Nami's disappearance. Hirose claimed that he and Nami had a dispute over $2,700. This amount was supposed to be his payment for their date, but he didn't want to pay. He said that around 8 p.m. that evening, he drove Nami to a main road where she got out of the car. Hirose didn't expect Nami to track him down at his home around 9 p.m. When she arrived, he deceived her again, saying he would take her to the nearest ATM to withdraw the money. Nami got back into the car, but on the way, Hirose dropped her off at a location far from his home. This time, Nami did not return to demand her money again. At this point, when the police were feeling stuck, a lead from a local resident grabbed their attention and became a turning point in the investigation. While watching TV at home, this resident came across a news report about a missing girl named Nami Kikuchi in Kamisu City. 
It reminded him of an incident that had happened two months earlier when he had found a pink coat in a nearby field. He thought the coat might be connected to the missing girl mentioned in the news, so he called the police and reported his discovery of the pink coat. Upon receiving this information, the police contacted Nami's family and friends to verify the details. They confirmed that the pink coat belonged to Nami, who had been wearing it when she left school that afternoon. The police then suspected that Nami might not simply be missing, but had been murdered and dumped. The likely culprit was Koichi Hirose. The police interrogated Hirose again and informed him that they had found the pink coat. This time, possibly realizing he could no longer escape punishment, Hirose finally admitted that he had killed Nami. He then recounted the events of that day. At around 9 p.m. on the night of the incident, after leaving the apartment, Nami had come back to his apartment one more time. When he opened the door, Nami took out her phone and snapped a photo of his face. She threatened to post the picture on Twitter if Hirose didn't give her $2,000 he had promised. Nami said she would expose him to the public as a disgusting person. Fearing that Nami would indeed post the picture online, Hirose agreed to take her to a nearby ATM to withdraw the money. However, on the way, Nami began yelling loudly. Afraid that her actions would attract attention, Hiros covered her mouth with his hand to silence her. Unfortunately, in doing so for too long, he unintentionally suffocated Nami. Panicked and unsure of what to do, Hiros eventually calmed down and drove to a remote field where he dug a hole and buried Nami's body. He then scattered her clothes in various spots across the field and threw her cell phone into a river. Based on Hirose's confession, at around 1.30 a.m. the following day, the police found Nami's body buried under 20 inches of soil in a field in the Kyoto area of Kamisu City. Her body was unclothed and had already begun to decompose. An autopsy confirmed that there were no obvious injuries on Nami's body, and the cause of death was determined to be suffocation. The location where her body was found was 8.5 miles southeast of Hirose's home. That day, the police formally arrested Koichi Hirose. Koichi Hirose was born in February 1983 in Tsuchira City, southern Ibaraki Prefecture. At the time of the crime, he was 35 years old, the second of three siblings. Hirose's family had a difficult financial situation. His father did not have a stable job and usually took on temporary work. His mother was a housewife who, in addition to caring for her children, also looked after Hirose's elderly grandmother. To help make ends meet, his mother took in laundry from neighbors for extra money. When Hirose was in kindergarten, his father passed away. After that, the family moved to Ishioka City in southern Ibaraki. Due to their financial struggles, Hirose grew up on government assistance. Perhaps due to these circumstances, Hirose developed an introverted and timid personality from an early age. In elementary school, he had trouble getting along with some of his classmates and developed a dislike for attending school. To avoid going, Hirose frequently argued with his mother and grandmother, sometimes even breaking windows in the house in frustration. By middle school, Hirose still had no interest in attending school, instead becoming absorbed in video games and dreaming of becoming one of the characters. At the age of 16, Hirose graduated from junior high. He did not continue to high school, but instead chose to enter the workforce, taking on various temporary jobs like stocking shelves in supermarkets, waiting tables at restaurants, and laboring at construction sites. Time passed, and by 2017, at the age of 34, Hiros was arrested for sexually harassing a schoolgirl. After paying a fine, he moved out of his family's home in Ishioka and relocated to a small apartment in Kamisu City, Ibaraki Prefecture, concealing his criminal record as he sought work locally. Five months before the incident, Hiros found a job at a construction materials company in Kashima City. Despite having secured a stable job, Hiros remained deeply engrossed in various video games. His favorite game at the time was Pokemon Go. One day, while playing Knives Out, Hirose met an 18-year-old teammate named Nami Kikuchi. The two frequently stayed in touch, even exchanging personal contact information outside of the game. Hirose not only enjoyed playing games, but also liked befriending young women online, arranging dates in exchange for money. In Japan, this practice is known as Papa Katsu, sugar daddy arrangements. 
Because Nami was under 20 years old, the police did not reveal much information about her. It was around 6 p.m. that evening when Hirose met Nami for the first time. He drove his silver K-car to wait for her outside a 7-Eleven convenience store near his home. When they met, Hirose, wanting to hide the exact location of his residence to avoid potential trouble, asked Nami to cover her eyes as he drove. Nami, not suspecting anything, complied with his request. The two spent some time at Hirose's apartment. Around 8 p.m., Hirose told Nami that he would drive her to a nearby train station and pay her the money they had agreed upon. Again, Nami was blindfolded as Hirose drove. However, instead of paying her, Hirose left Nami in a remote field and quickly drove back home, telling her that he didn't intend to give her the money. When Nami realized she had been deceived, she was furious. With insufficient funds to return home, she became determined to get the money she was owed. Using her memory and the map on her phone, Nami retraced her steps back to the area near the 7-Eleven where they had first met. She asked several passers-by and residents for directions, ultimately finding Hirose's apartment, thanks to a helpful resident who gave her the address. At around 9 p.m., Nami returned to apartment 203 and confronted Hirose once again. Fearing that he might trick her again, she took out her phone and snapped a picture of his face. Under the threat that she would expose him online, Hirose reluctantly agreed to drive her to an ATM and withdraw the money. However, Hirose had no intention of paying. As they drove, the two began arguing again, and Hirose became agitated. In a panic, Hirose killed Nami during the confrontation. According to the manager at the construction materials company where Hirose worked, Hirose had asked for an advance on his wages a few days before the incident, claiming he was short on money. On the day of the crime, Hirose had taken a day off from work. His boss had no idea that Hirose had committed a murder that day, as he returned to work the next day, as though nothing had happened. Two years after the crime, the Tokyo District Court held a trial for Koichi Hirose. He was charged with causing injury leading to death and other related offenses. During the trial, the police argued that Hirose's actions were brutal, as he had physically overpowered the victim by covering her nose and mouth. They also pointed out that Hirose's attempt to cheat Nami out of the money showed his selfishness. Hirose's defense lawyer, however, argued that while Hirose and Nami had a financial dispute, Hirose had no intention of killing her. He only felt that Nami was being too loud, so he covered her mouth and nose, not realizing that this would unintentionally cause her death. The lawyer added that Hirose had buried Nami's body out of fear and confusion, not malice. After the trial, the Tokyo District Court found Koichi Hirose guilty of causing injury resulting in death, along with other charges, and sentenced him to 14 years in prison. Nami Kikuchi's case is not only a tragic story, but also serves as a cautionary tale about the potential dangers of meeting strangers from the internet. While many questions remain about Hirose's true motives, the irreversible consequences of his actions are undeniable. From this tragedy, we hope valuable lessons can be learned to protect ourselves and those around us. And that concludes today's case. Do you believe Hirose's testimony is entirely truthful? Share your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.